Hey guys, welcome to lesson five of the true beauty of math, where we finally get to see Russell's paradox. This is one of the most famous logical paradoxes that my, mankind has ever uncovered, so let's take a look at how this goes. We're going to need to use a lot of what we learned in the last lesson about sets of sets. Namely, we know that we can form sets of sets, and we sets whose elements are themselves sets. So let's consider the following very important example of a set of sets. Let's consider the set of all sets. So this is the set whose elements are sets and which contains every set that exists as an element of itself. But what we find is that the set of all sets must therefore contain itself as an element. After all, the set of all sets is a set, but it's the set of all sets. Therefore, it actually contains itself as an element. So we notice that the set of all sets is a set which contains itself as an element. Now, this is very different from any other sets that we've seen. For example, the set A equals 1, 2, 3 doesn't contain itself as an element. The elements of A are 1, 2, and 3, and none of those elements are the set A. So this does not contain itself. Indeed, every single set that we've seen so far does not contain itself as an element. But so now we're faced with the obvious next question. Once we realize that some sets contain themselves, namely we've at least found one set that contains itself as an element, and some sets do not contain themselves, we can consider the following two sets. Let's consider the set of all sets that contain themselves set of all sets that contain themselves. So namely, the set of all sets would be an element of this set. The set of all sets is a set that contains itself as an element, and this is the set of all sets that contain themselves. Therefore, the set of all sets is an element of the set of all sets that contain themselves. We can also consider the set of all sets that don't contain themselves. By considering these two sets, we should be able to place any set in the whole universe into one or the other of these two sets. Because any set that the enemy might hand us will either contain itself as an element or it won't contain itself as an element. Therefore, any set that we could possibly think of must either be in this set or in this set. So let's ask which set, the set of all sets that don't contain themselves, which is itself a perfectly good set, let's ask which set this set is contained in. So keep in mind, we have the set of all sets that contain themselves. The set of all sets is an element of the set of all sets that contain themselves. And a lot of other sets, for example, this set A equals 1, 2, 3, would be an element of the set of all sets that don't contain themselves. This is a set that doesn't contain itself, therefore it's in the set of all sets that don't contain themselves. But now we can ask, what set is the set of all sets an element of? Well, it's got to be either this set or this set. Let's see what happens in either case. If the set of all sets that don't contain themselves is in the set of all sets that do contain themselves, then it would not be in this set, because any set can either be in here or in here, not neither and not both. So if this set is in this set, then it's not in this set. But if the set of all sets that don't contain themselves is not in this set, then it doesn't contain itself. Therefore, it should actually be in this set. So by supposing that this set is in this set, we've actually found that this set needs to be in this set, which is, a which is a contradiction. But to get to the paradox, we then need to see what happens if we do let this set be an element of this set. So suppose the set of all sets that don't contain themselves is indeed an element of the set of all sets that don't contain themselves. It would then problematically contain itself, because now it is an element of the set of all sets that don't contain themselves, which means it does contain itself, which means that it should actually be in the set of all sets that do contain themselves. And that's where the paradox comes. By supposing that this set is an element of this set, we find that it's actually an element of this set. 
And if we suppose that, the that this set is an element of this set, we actually find that it's an element of this set. So what we find is that this set simply can't be in either one of these sets, which is a problem because we've already figured out that any set must be in either this set or this set. So where have we gone wrong? That's Russell's paradox. Rus Bertrand Russell came up with this paradox, and it totally shattered all of set theory. And there are now lots of smart people who are trying to figure out what the axioms of set theory really are to make it so that we don't run into paradoxes like this. And you might ask, where was the trick in our wording to make it so that we ran into this paradox? And the trick is that there really is no trick. This is a genuine problem with the logic that we use so far in constructing elements and sets. And this should be shocking to you because everything that we've done so far has seemed to be the most natural and obvious thing that we can possibly do. But what we found is that the logic that is most intuitive to us simply doesn't work. Now, we're going to plow forward with math and put these subtleties behind us and trust that there have been lots of smart people who have figured out these kinds of problems. And we're going to keep moving forward so that we don't get bogged down in these details. But it's important for us to see that even in the most obvious natural setting of elements and sets, we run into some really remarkably subtle logic and that we need to be very, very careful every step along the way as we're doing math. So let us appreciate this paradox, see how we've stumbled into it, doing what seems to be the most natural and obvious things, and then let's put it behind us and keep moving forward with math and start to uncover equally beautiful and amazing truths uh, which don't have any paradoxes hidden within them. For more details on Russell's paradox, you can check out the written lesson where we also give a warm-up paradox that is similar in nature to this one, but a little bit easier to manage on one's first exposure to it. And for even more details than that, you can check out The True Beauty of Math, Volume 1, where we go over this paradox in even more detail and discuss some of the uh, ways that people have tried to fix it and the ways that we convince ourselves that it's still okay to move forward with math, even though these foundations may seem a little shaky at times. Once we're happy with the paradox that we've just uncovered, I'll go ahead and see you guys in lesson six. See you there.